Okay, verse 9. It says, So then they which be of faith are blessed with, Abra with faithful Abraham. Now this word faith, people misuse the, misuse the word faith. So then they which be of faith are blessed with Abraham, with faithful Abraham. There's, there's more to it than just faith in this. I have faith that the Lord's going to do this or the Lord's not going to do that. Well, if we read verse 26, the ne a little further down, it says, For ye are all children of God by faith. Again, some people put a period right there. But if you keep reading, it says, In Christ Jesus. So where's our faith? Our faith is in Christ Jesus. Not that, okay, well, I, I have faith that the Lord's going to do this or He's going to do that, you know. No, our faith is in Christ. And the way we have faith is by going on what God says in the Word of God, in His words, in the Bible. That's what, whatever this Bible says, that was, this is Jesus, right? This is what we have faith in. If there's someone who's lost and I'm praying for him, you know, I'm not going to say, I have faith that the Lord's going to save him. And that doesn't mean anything. I, I could have a hundred thousand tons of faith, but if this person doesn't accept the Lord, and, the, and God's not going to make this person accept them. So this, this person might not ever give their life to the Lord. And it doesn't matter how many times I say, I have faith in the Lord that this person's going to get saved. doesn't mean anything. Right here it says to have faith in Christ Jesus. That's where our faith goes, in Christ Jesus. And as it goes into Christ Jesus, it goes into His Word, into His words. Now when He says something, when He, I have faith, I'm going to heaven. Because God said that. And that's, I have faith in that. What he says, that's what I have faith in. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Just because you put faith that this might happen or this might not happen, if it's not in the Word, then you're just, you're just throwing the word faith out there. But it says to have faith in Jesus. In Jesus. That's where our faith is about to be. There. This is the way we were before. Before. We put our faith in Christ Jesus. Now these are the scriptures. In Romans 5.10, he says, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. But Romans right here, I'm showing that we were enemies. Before we put our faith in Jesus, we were enemies. Ephesians 2.3 says, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So we were children, we were totally against God. We were totally against Him. We were fighting Him. We, didn't even know it. we were fighting Him, yeah. We were fighting Him. Like before I got saved, I mean, I had people who would come up to me and talk to me about the Lord, and I didn't want to hear it. I fought it. I didn't want to hear it. Whereas that's the way we are before you put your faith in Christ. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil. And it goes on, but this is what I'm trying to show. Before you put faith, your faith, in Christ Jesus, these three scriptures show how we were. Ye are of, ye are of your father the devil. Now, did we say we were, yeah, I'm live, I live for the devil. Did we say that? Now, some people say it jokingly like it's funny. But in reality, that's what we were doing. We were living for the devil. Because when you're not living for God, that's what's left. When you're living for yourself, family, whatever. If it's not God, it's of the devil. So this is the way we were before we put our faith in Christ Jesus. Our faith in Christ Jesus. I can't emphasize it enough. Our faith in Christ Jesus is this right here. The Bible. Now, do we read this Bible and believe it no matter what? Do we? Do we really? I mean, it's, there's a lot of stuff in here that's hard if, you, if, you're, if you're doing it in the flesh. But everything in here, if you got the, Holy, the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing in here is hard. Nothing. What God says, okay, women, I want you to do this. You can do it when you're, when you're in the Spirit. Men, I want you to do this. We can do it. As long as we allow the Holy Spirit, who's given us power, to take over. But a lot of times, 
We don't. We get in the flesh. The word faith and believe in the Greek, that's the, it means the same thing. So it says, where it says faith or believe, those, those two words are the same. If, you, if it says believe, you can put faith there also. If it says faith, you can put believe there. And let's drop down to verse 29. And if ye be Christ's, then ye, then ye are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Those of us who are Christians are Abraham's children. And all that God promised him also belongs to us. How are we going to go on? How are we going to know what these promises are? Unless we read the Old Testament. Because the Lord gave the, old, the promises in the Old Testament. So we need to, again, remember this whole teaching is on showing we need the Old Testament. We need to read the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. And what it says in the New Testament still goes today. In Romans 8.17 it says, And if children, then heirs. If we're Christians, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. So we, if we suffer like Jesus did, and how did He suffer? He was rejected. What's, what's the Bible say in the Old Testament? He came down and we spit on Him. We rejected Him. And then even in the New Testament, they killed Him. Now right here it says, if we suffer like He suffered. Being a Christian, I've said it over and over, is not popular. You're not going to be a popular person. Jesus was not popular. When Jesus was popular, it was when He was feeding, when He was giving. When He fed the 5,000, when He was giving, people would come around. He had a lot of people there. But when it came down to it, okay, is this the Son of God? Is this the Christ? He wasn't given then. What did they shout? Probably the same people. Because all in the same area. They were shouting crucify. So suffer. Suffering like Christ. We're in, a, we're in a place where we are not wanted. This world. Remember who is the prince of this world right now? Satan. Satan. This is his world right now. So we're in a place where we're not wanted. When we live for the Lord, people don't want to, they don't want to hear what we have to say. Uh, we're not going to be popular. Jesus was not popular. And then it says, then we will be glorified in heaven with the Father. Now, all what I just said is worth it. Because when at the end, we will be with the Father. We will be with God. Seeing God face to face. See, right now we can't see Him. We can know Him and know His personality and who He is by the Word, but we can't see Him. But there's going to day, there's a day coming where we're going to see Him face to face. God. And we better have our new new bodies because if we don't, I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> that's, how, that's how glorious it's going to be to see God. We can't comprehend it. We can't comprehend seeing God right now. I, I mean, it's like... We can't comprehend what it's going to be like when we do see Him. But we will. We will be glorified with Him. And in Hebrews 6.13, For when God made promise, promise to Abraham, because He could swear by no greater, He swore by Himself. So what He's saying here, there's no one in the universe that God that is greater than God. God couldn't say, I swear to, like sometimes we say we swear to God, well, God couldn't do that because there's no one greater than Him. So right here, He took an oath on His own name. God swore to God. And that covenant is unbreakable. Now, there's some people out there who believe we have to, you have to be circumcised, circumcised to be saved. Which, it's mainly Jews. But even other, they have some people other than Jews that believe that also. Remember, the Jews have not recognized Jesus Christ. Okay, they have not recognized Him as being the Christ or the Messiah. So they still have it that they need to be circumcised to be right with God. And that's what we're going to see here. Okay, Genesis 15, 
4 through 6. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thy, thy heir. Now, what, he's, what the Lord is saying to Abraham right now, remember, he had a, a child with a handmaid. Sarah had a handmaid, a, a maid. And since Sarah said she was too old to have a kid, she told Abraham to go, you know, take my handmaid, take my maid and have a child through her. And right here is saying, this is not thy heir. This is what God has told Abraham. That, that son you had there, that's not your heir. But he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thy heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stores if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. This, remember, the seed is Jesus. Yeah. All right. Why isn't that adultery? Oh, it is adultery. I mean, just because it's in the Bible and Sarah said it was okay to do it, that doesn't mean it's, it's okay to do. There's a lot of sins in the Bible that just the Lord points them out. But just because the Bible says that Sarah told her husband it's okay if you have her, that doesn't make it biblical that we can do that. Right. So, And to understand that, that's why you have to read the Bible because you'll see what the Lord says and, and that right there, like that's adultery. Even if your wife gives you the okay. Okay? Because God says it's adultery. Plainly. And the Bible doesn't contradict itself, but people got to have a, have a little common sense and know that this is coming from Sarah. This is not coming from the Lord. Just like Samson. I mean, look, how many wives did he have? Thousands. Does that mean we can have as many wives as we want? You know? We got to know what is Jewish customs, Jewish ways, and what's of the Lord. Verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted to him for righteousness. Now right here, Genesis 15, that I can show it, but I'm not going to do it because it will take too much time. But at this time right here, Abraham was 85 years old. Remember that. Abraham was 85 years old right here. And God said... And he believed in the Lord, speaking of Abraham, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So Abraham was right with the Lord at 85 years old. Okay? Remember that. Now, in Genesis 17, two chapters later, 1724, And Abraham was 90 years old and nine, so he was 99 years old, when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Okay, that's when Abraham got circumcised. Abraham was not a Jew. In Deuteronomy 26, 5, it'll tell you that, that Abraham was a Syrian. He was not a Jew. So he got circumcised at 99 years old. Not, and now at 85, that's when he was 85 years old, the Lord said, you're right. You're right with me. Okay, remember that. This was a Jew, like I said, just this was a Jewish custom they had, but it never meant it never was meant to be a way of salvation to be circumcised, not biblically. Just like we talked about Sarah saying it was okay for Abraham. Okay, just same thing right here. This is the way the Jewish took it, but it was never meant to be that way. Now remember, this is a custom. I'm gonna get more on it. This is a custom. Circumcision on the foreskin had nothing to do with salvation. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 25 and 26, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the, with the uncircumcised, un, uncircumcised, saying, God will punish those who have only been circumcised on the body and not the heart. See, we're going to learn in the scriptures, this is where we get circumcised now. This is what this is where the Lord wants you to get circumcised. Okay, the Jewish custom it was a physical thing on a body. You know, uh, verse twenty six says Egypt and Judah, Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are in the up, upmost corners that dwell in the wilderness. For all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart. All of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart. 
Now we know all of Israel, they're Jews, Israel, we know that all the men got circumcised. Now I think it was eight days after they were born, they had to be circumcised, they had to be cut. Okay, that was for the Jews. But right here the Lord is saying, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised. But he's not talking about on the foreskin, he's talking about the heart. He's talking about the heart here. The Jews, the Jews lived the way a lot of us live today. Think. See, a lot of people today think that their works is going to get them to heaven. What they do, the good deeds they do, that's what they're going to. That's what's going to get them to heaven. And this is this is what the Jews did. Works. They thought works was going to get them right with the Lord, just like right here. But the Lord said, "Hey, you're." uncircumcised in the heart meaning your heart is not right with me God has always looked at the heart always the Jewish parents had their babies and they had them circumcised because that's what they thought made them right with God now are we doing the same thing today yes we do things to babies parents do things to babies that is just a ritual traditional thing of the church Thinking that this baby is right with the God, with God now, we still do it today. Different religions do it in different ways, but we still do it today. Do rituals or traditions, thinking we got our child right with God, our baby, which you don't get right with God by by any kind of works. You don't get right with God until you know who God is. All this stuff they do with babies, it's for nothing. They don't count for anything, biblically. Just like here, they would circumcise the boys at eight, year, at eight days old, thinking that made them right with God. Wrong. And it's still wrong today. The only thing that's going to get you right with God is when you grow up and you accept Him in your heart. Then you're circumcised in the heart. If we, would we know what, what this verse means in the New Testament? See, what I'm trying to show is we need the New Testament to understand the Old Testament and the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it talks about circumcision. But the New Testament tells you what circumcision the Lord looks at. He don't look at the circumcision of a physical thing. He looks at the circumcision of the heart. Right. I don't understand the comparison. Circumcision, they're cutting the foreskin. And the Jews are circumcision of the heart. I don't understand. Col Colossians chapter 2 next chapter next next verses and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power in whom ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ that should answer your question right there the Lord always the Lord always wanted us to see that we needed to be circumcised in the heart and not a physical one. Like I said, the Jews still believe that, and they still do it today. But we, the true Christians, those of us who, who have accepted the Lord, who have looked at Jesus as being the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, we can accept this. We see this. Jews don't see They have not accepted it, so they don't see this. But it says, made without hands. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22 because it says in putting off the body of sins well Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22 says that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts so the Lord is saying put off the way you used to live your former ways you got to put that off you got to cut that off just like me I had to cut off the, the getting drunk all the time. I had to cut off a lot of stuff. All right? I had to cut it off. And that's what it says right here. To cut it off. And putting off the body. To cut it off. Can also, you cut off or put off? Put off. This is which we, we put that as the same thing. It's the same thing. You put it off or you cut it off. You're, okay. you're cutting it out of your life. Okay. And that's why he puts circumcision in this. Because it's, it's it's meaning the same thing. You cut this off. Whatever it is, cut it off. Whatever's got you not living for the Lord. 
Colossians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye put off the old man with his deeds. So in verse 11 up here it says, in putting off, but these are two verses in the New Testament that I showed is you're putting off. You're, you're, the way you used to be, you're cutting it off. You're turning your back on it, however you want to say it, but you're turning from it. So if you're putting something off, what are you putting on? If you take something off, what are you going to put on? The Lord. We put on the Lord. Now, when our bodies are in the flesh, like I said before, we we war against God. And I put some verses. There's a lot more. But I put some verses here. This is us until we put our faith in Jesus. Until we cut off the old man, which the Bible calls us the old man several times. The old man meaning your old self. In John 6, 63, human efforts accomplish nothing. That's what I'm saying. Human efforts. You're going to work your way to heaven. He says right here, it accomplished nothing. Romans 8.8 8, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're not walking in the Spirit, what's walking in the Spirit? Obeying the Word of God. That's what walking in the Spirit is. Obeying the Word of God. If God says, hey, don't do this, and you're not doing it, you're obeying God. That's walking in the Spirit. If He says, do this, and you do it, that's walking in the Spirit. That's walking with the Lord. But it says right here, if you're walking in the flesh, you cannot please God. Romans seven eighteen, And I know that nothing good lives in me. Now this is talking about lost people here. I know that nothing good lives in me. That's why I give anything I do that's good, I give all the credit to the Lord. Because I know me. I know the way I used to be. So anything that comes out good, good in me is from the Lord. Because nothing, right here it says, nothing good lives in me. Romans 7, 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motion of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruits unto death. So when we were in the flesh, everything we did, the fruits of our life, was on to death because nothing we did until you accept Jesus Christ in your heart nothing you do is right so all the fruits you have until you give your life to the Lord all the fruits that you have is on to death you're, you're dead like the Bible says we're dead until we accept Jesus we're just walking zombies 1 John 2.16 for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but as of the world. So we, if we still live this way, it's of the world and not of the Father. We're still in the flesh. Jeremiah 17, 9. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? So until we accept Jesus Christ in our, in our heart, until we put Jesus in our heart, right here the Lord says, our heart is desperately wicked. That's what the Lord is saying. So, if you don't have the Jesus in your heart, in your heart, I don't care how good you are out there. I don't care if you take the shirt off your back. If you don't have Jesus in your heart, your heart is desperately wicked. That's the way the Lord looks at it. Proverbs 28, 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whosoever walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Be delivered. So if you're trusting, in, when people come up to me and, well, I think I'm going to heaven because, well, guess what? They're trusting in their own heart, what they think. And what's, what's he say? They're a fool. I mean, the Lord said that. When you're going on what you think is going to get you to heaven, the Lord says you're a fool. Now, this is the way we are without the Lord. And this is what we have to cut off, put off. How you repent of to get our hearts circumcised and be right with the Lord. Do we understand that? Now Galatians chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision, 
circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Being circumcised or not means nothing, but to believe, <clears throat> but to believe that brings love. When you become a believer, you know we don't have the. We think we know what love is, but until we get the Lord's love in us, that agape love that the Bible talks about, agape love. Until we get that kind of love in us, it's hard to be meek. It's hard to be merciful. But with God's love, we can do those things. With God's love. Alright, we understand that? With God's love. Agape love, which is the Bible talks about. Agape love. That's God's love. When we get that, then we can love. True love. Because true love overlooks. True love is patient. And just like I said before, true love is... The Lord, the way the Lord looks at us. How many times do we fail the Lord? Over and over. And what? And He still what? He still loves us. Amen. If someone does something to us, we're ready to snap and, and get back at them. We're ready to put them on our hit list. Huh? True Christians don't do that. True Christians, we have agape love. We can be patient, we can be meek, and we can be merciful, and so on. And then in verse 7, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? The Lord saying, you started off good, but then who turned you from obeying the Scriptures? And that's happened. A lot of people start off good, but then they, I uh, hate to say it, but then they get caught up in religion, Religion will turn you away from the Lord. Religion turns you away from the Scriptures and onto man's way. The religion is man, okay? Christianity is of the Lord. Religion is of man. Remember that. Verse 7, This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. The Lord is saying right here, It sure didn't come from me, because I'm the one who called you. The Lord is the one who called us, right? John 6.44, it says it. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up in the last days. So who has to draw us? The Father draws us. Okay, so it wasn't the Lord that told us to do, to, uh, to do these things. Most churches have all kind of man-made pro programs to get you to accept the Lord. I mean, it, it, invitation at the end of church. They got the piano playing. They got the music real low, playing soft music, singing songs. That doesn't get people saved. If the message that the preacher preached did not get you saved, if he preached in the Spirit, if he preached in the Spirit, that means the Father was calling you. He's preaching in the Spirit. If that doesn't get you saved, then what the heck they believe that playing soft music is going to get you saved? Right? right. Now there's... Maybe this is why I, I don't have a church to preach in. <laughs> but it's true, though. It is true. We have man-made things to try to get people to come know, to know the Lord. When, the, when we read it right here in John 6, 44, you can only come to the Lord when the Father, when the Father draws you. And He draws everyone. Because in the book of John, chapter 1, he says, I enlighten the heart of all men. So there's no one on the day of judgment that's going to be able to go to the Father and say, I didn't know. Because somehow, some way, the guy that's in the, middle of, in the middle of the jungle is going to know about God. Because God said in his word, he said, I will enlighten all men. I will show myself to all men. God said that. Verse 9, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. In verse 6, the Lord uses those who are circumcised or not circumcised as an example. Things that lead you away from the Lord. We have that today. Do you eat pork? Well, there's teachings out there. It's a sin to eat pork. Stuff like that. A little leaven. A little something right here. Leaven is the whole lump, it says. Do you eat meat on Fridays? These things draw you away from the Lord. This Don't eat meat on Friday. That's not the Word of God. But this is a religious thing. Do you speak in tongues? 
Whether you speak in tongues or not, the Bible says, believe in God and you're right. Just like Abraham. And what did I say that word believe means? Faith. Faith. It also means you're saying, I'm the bride of, God, of, of Christ. So if you're a bride of Christ, you're going to obey Him. Then on the day of Pentecost, they spoke in tongues. There's many times they spoke in tongues in the Bible. In fact, it's a gift from God. Mm -hmm. But also, the Bible does say that it's the least of all gifts. Well, yeah, you don't have to speak in tongues. Right. But, that, the, but what do we have today? We have people saying, that, well, if you didn't speak in tongues, you're not right with the Lord. You're not saved. I'm just pointing all these things out. Just like circumcised, uncircumcised. Well, we still do today, but we do it with different stuff. Different sayings. Do you got water baptized or not? Well, water baptism, just like tongues, it doesn't save you. You got people out there. Church of Christ is one of them. You got to be water baptized if you want to make it to heaven. It's not true. Just little things like this. A little leaven. A little off the off off of this, the Bible, just a little bit, will what leaven the whole, well, the whole lump, messes up the whole thing. It brings Christianity down. How many people are out there are searching, but they don't know which way to go because of all the different religions we got? Because of all these little, these are little things. These are not really big, but these are little things. And because of these little things, people are confused and don't know who who to go listen to, or what church to go to. I mean, that's the way I was. I was raised Catholic, married to a Baptist, my boss was Pentecostal, and I had a sister who was Jehovah Witness. I didn't know who was telling me what, right? I was like, confused. So what did I do? Amen. I started reading the Bible. I started reading the Bible. And this is where the Lord has reached me. This is where he's opened my eyes. And this is what opens my eyes here. Not religion. Not listening to other people. If they're coming to me with the scriptures, I'm all ears. Okay? But we need, like I, the very beginning of this class was search the scriptures. That's what the Lord says. Search the scriptures. Continue in my word. The Bible. So all these little things... Right here, the Lord says, a little leaven, a little thing that's not true, will leaven the whole lump, which it has. Christianity is, is for a lost person, it's hard for him to find Christianity because he just, he just doesn't know what church to go to. Now, verse 12, I would that they were even cut off which trouble you. This is what the Lord said, I wish they were even cut off which trouble you. How do we know who's troubling us? When they come to you with traditions and it's not in here, when they come to you with rituals and it's not in here, that's the ones who's going to confuse you. That's the ones who's going to trouble you. That's what he's talking about. The way we cut them off, those who trouble us, is to leave them. If they're confusing you, if what they're saying doesn't line up with the Word of God, it says to cut them off. Cut off those who trouble you. Okay, follow the one who's teaching the scriptures. Follow the man who's teaching the scriptures in the spirit, and then you go home and read those scriptures, and check them out, and make sure he didn't take the verse out of context. I mean, that means you're going to have to work. That means we're going to have to read the Bible. That's that's it. If you don't read the Bible, then you better be ready, because you're just going to follow anybody who comes with whatever. You understand what I'm saying? Because you don't know if they're telling you the truth or not. So whatever man comes to you, check him out. Like when my, my teacher, even though I know he's got the gift of teaching, but he's not God. I check him out. My pastor, same thing. I've got to see it in the Word of God. Know that it's lined up with the Word of God for me to accept it. But if you don't know, if you don't read the Word... So when you don't read the word, anybody, a wolf can come up to you that's dressed in sheep's clothing, who talks like a sheep, and just tell you anything, and you're like, oh, and take it. Because you don't know. So those who trouble you, cut them off. Cut them off. That's what it says. Verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. 
We have been set free from being under the devil. We're talking to Christians, yeah. So we have, our, we have been set free. Our liberty is that we're no longer under Satan. He is no longer our father, like I said uh, earlier. That is freedom. That is freedom, knowing that you no longer follow the devil. Even though before you wouldn't say, I'm following the devil, but you've learned through the scriptures that's what we were doing. Right. Okay? And it's not a freedom to sin. Like some Baptists think. They believe in once saved, always saved. They think that once you get saved, you'll always be saved no matter how you live. So what they believe. But a person who is really born again, that is really saved, really saved, they're not going to want to sin. They're going to sin, but it's not going to be a want to sin, like a freedom to sin. You understand what I'm saying? That that phrase, once saved, always saved, a lot of there's a lot of people who take that phrase and believe, well, I walked the aisle, I got baptized, I got saved, now I can live like I want. Doesn't mean that at all. That's not the liberty the Lord gave us. He didn't give us the liberty to sin. He forgives sins because we're going to sin. But He didn't give us the freedom just to go out there and sin. Because now we think we're right. Because we did a tradition. Walk the aisle. But it says to love the way God loves. And I just told you what kind of love that is. The way Abraham got saved in the Old Testament is still the same way in the New Testament. Same thing. He believed in God. Romans, New Testament, Romans 4.3 says it. Abraham believed God and was counted for him for righteousness. That's in the New Testament. Back to the question, what did Abraham believe? Again, that the Messiah, the Son of God, would come through his bloodline. That's what he believed. Abraham got the revelation about Jesus and believed it. God showed him, hey, Jesus is coming through your bloodline, and he believed it. He obeyed and believed God. Because God, like we last week, God told him to leave the house, told him to leave the family. He did it. He obeyed. Whatever God told him to do, he obeyed it. He obeyed God. That's part of believing is obeying God. If I was a lost person and I decided to start reading the Bible myself and I was lost, do you know how long it would take me to get from Genesis to John 3.16 that everybody uses just about? Just about everybody uses John 3.16 to show people you need the Lord. Okay? But that's a lot of reading. You know how long it would take me to read that before I get saved? Seriously. So you don't... If you wait till you get to the New Testament that people say this is the only thing that counts, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Read the Bible. Right here in Genesis. Just reading the first book of Genesis, you can get saved. If you got to wait until you get to John 3.16... Oh my gosh. I wouldn't be saved yet. Huh? Jesus has many names in the Bible. He has many names. One of them we just read. We just learned. He's called the seed. The seed of Abraham. Okay? He's called the branch. In Isaiah 40 point, uh, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2, he's, Jesus is called the branch. Jehovah. He's called Jehovah. That's in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born. A child. Who's, what child is that? Jesus. We're not talking about just any child. The whole Bible talks about what child being born. Jesus. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called... Now, this is some of his names... His name shall be called Wonderful. His name would be called Counselor. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Everlasting Father. So that makes Jesus who? Right there, this verse shows you that God, that Jesus is God. Right? Upon us a child is born. Was God ever a child? No. No. But right here it says a child is born and this is going to be his name. And one of his names is the Everlasting Father. Amen? Amen. The Prince of Peace. These are all the different names of Jesus. If people would read 
and and I mean not just read, but if they would study the Bible, they would see it right there in that one verse. A child is born, and his name is going to be the everlasting Father. Now, how much more than that do you need to show that Jesus is God? I mean, once you look at it, and, and look, I mean, really look at it, it's pretty simple, ain't it? Yeah. To me, it is. Abraham grew in his belief in God so much that he was willing. Now, Abraham had so much faith and believed in God and so much that he was willing to kill his own son. Abraham believed in God so much he was willing to kill it. When God said to sacrifice Isaac, his son, did Abraham turn away from it? Now, Abraham, I'm sure he was thinking, well, if I kill my son, how is the seed going to come through me if I'm going to kill my son? But what Abraham said, I'm sure this is what Abraham said. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I know he can do it. If I kill my son, either he's going to resurrect him, bring him back to life, or something. Because he said, God promised me that the seed would come through me. So if, if he has me uh, kill my son, I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. Now, how many of us live our life that way? How many of us live that way? God, I, don't, I know this is what you want me to do. How are you going to accomplish this or whatever? But I know you're God. How many of us live that way, thinking that way? Abraham did. He was just a man. In Genesis, in Genesis 22, verse 5, it says, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abraham's young men, not his sons, men that, he, that, he, that worked for him. He said, Abide ye here with the ass, and, and I and the lad, him and his son, will go yonder, and worship and come again to you. Now, Abra now God told Abraham, go up here, sacrifice Isaac. So Abraham's going, and then he leaves the, the guys that work for him, he leaves them behind, and he tells them, he says, I and the lad, his son, are going to come back again. Like I said, Abraham, I'm sure he, I don't know how this is going to happen, but the promise is the seed's going to come through me, so somehow, some way, me and my son are coming back. I'm going to sacrifice him. I believe and obey. Are y'all hearing me? Yeah. I believe and obey. God, whatever you said, I'm going to do it. That's <laughs> I mean, seriously. I, Abraham was ready to kill his son. Yeah. I'm, I'm serious. Come on. Abraham was really... To, he obeyed and believed God so much, he was willing to sacrifice his son. No matter what. No matter what. And you can't go no much further than that. But no matter what, we should obey God. If God speaks to us and says something, we need to obey Him. If He says, Jesse, Jody, quit y'all's job. Go to Africa. We could, we, then we should quit our jobs and go to Africa. How is He going to support us? I don't know. How are we going to get there? I don't know. But if He says to do it, I'm going to obey I'm just using that as an example. Do we obey God when He tells us to do something? If we don't, if we can't understand how He's going to do it, does that keep us from obeying Him? If we can't see how He's going to accomplish it, it does a lot of people. Quit my job? Well, I had to do it once. My boss said, "Quit your." I mean, I want you to move to Dallas or Austin. Start my company over there. I want to expand. But God told me, "Take care of your parents." You're the oldest son. You take care of your parents. So, do I have faith? Uh, did I have faith to say, okay, God, you told me to do this. And it just happened I did it. But, how many men would quit their jobs, let, let themselves get fired, because God said, I want you to do this. And he got me another job. In fact, I was making, like I said, just a little bit more money than I was making before. But I quit my job because I know what the Word of God says. God told me I had to take care of my parents. So, even though it meant losing my job, I followed the Word of God. I obeyed. And I've been blessed. How many of us can do that? I'm not saying, not, not that I'm special or anything, but how many of us can obey God when it looks like, you want me to do what? We understand that? So, by reading the Old Testament, we can see what God means about having faith. Having faith. And it's like I said, it's not 
I, oh, I have faith that this is going to happen. Or No, that's not faith. The Bible says, have faith in Jesus. And when you have faith in Jesus, this is Jesus, the Bible. So have faith in the Word of God. That's what you have faith in and what He says. Now, there's a lot more. I mean, there's, there's so many ways I could have gone about teaching this lesson or how we need the Old Testament. Ephesians, now, Ephesians chapter 6, I think, it talks about the... The, the man being the savior of the body, the woman's body. There's no way you can understand that verse unless you read Ruth. The book of Ruth tells you, tells, explains what that means. And he is the savior of the body. The, talking about the man, the husband, not the Lord. It's talking about the husband. And he is the savior of the body. Talking about the woman. You can only understand that verse if you read the book of Ruth. So if there's anybody out there who still believes that you don't need the Old Testament, then you just haven't paid attention to nothing I've said or what the Scripture said. Amen? Any questions?